Thank you, everybody. So um, my claim to fame is that I'm Mary Ann's brother, uh, the girl who wrote the book. So I completed my family physician training in July of 97, and six months later, in February of 1998, I opened my own private practice specializing in the treatment of infertility and miscarriage using a crazy new system called NAPRO technology and fertility care. To date, I've treated about 3,000 patients, many successfully after years of infertility, failed IVF and multiple recurrent miscarriages. I'm really busy at the work that I do. Uh, my waiting list, I've got about 80 patients on my waiting list, which is about a six month waiting list. So I don't need more work and naltrexone doesn't help in that regard. I'm glad to say I've moved to a posh new place. Uh, it's the Galway Clinic in Ireland. It's a state-of-the-art private hospital. I've always known about naltrexone uh, from my medical training, and I hadn't been using it much until recently. So Hildreth has been using it off-label uh, to treat, of all things, resistant premenstrual syndrome. He's also been using it to treat infertility um, as an adjunct to the NAPRO technology fertility treatment. And, I did my training with him in 1995, and at that time, uh, it was really just kind of something he was looking at and wasn't really getting very good results. So I didn't use it. And then along comes Mary Ann, and she tells me that she's going to take Noel off his interferons and put him on naltrexone. And for once, I actually agreed with her, and I said, well, Mary, he's not doing so good otherwise. So uh, she told me it was this new treatment found by a neurologist. His primary progressive MS was getting worse and no improvement by the interferon. I said, well, look, you've nothing to lose, possibly everything to gain. So he went on it. She was convinced that uh, the progression of his MS had stopped. That was interesting, and I thought, well, that's great. And I didn't see any connection between my fertility work uh, at that time. And still uh, later, I went and I heard uh, Robert, an MS patient who started naltrexone again on Mary Ann's advice. He was in Galway, and he was talking from personal experience of how this drug had transformed his life. And it knocked my socks off. I said, this is huge. This guy's life has been totally changed. He was on all the interferons. And it, it's incredible. And it's not placebo because he had symptoms of MS and rheumatoid arthritis, debilitating fatigue. And I think it is a very important point to ever said it that fatigue doesn't describe enough uh, the profound tiredness that per somebody experiences. Everybody gets tired, but the tiredness that somebody has with an autoimmune condition is profound, and we need to coin a new phrase to measure that. Um, so we started the naltrexone, and one of the things I found from patients I put on it is the dramatic lift in their energy. And his was dramatic, plus the relief of his joint pain and no further progression of his MS, except when he ran out. And this, this gets rid of the placebo part, because, or if he forgets to take it for a time and uh, the symptoms would come back, but I'll always be controlled once you get back on the treatment. So I looked into it and heard what Dr. Bahari was doing for HIV, the autoimmune conditions, and the kind of dosages that he was using for it as a single tablet at night. And the theory given that uh, taking it at night, giving the brief temporary block, gives a threefold increase in endorphin levels. So I looked up the uh, circadian rhythm of endorphins uh, from 2 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. They surge during the nighttime hours and they come down during the day. And the thinking being, if you block the receptors at night, you'll give an exaggerated endorphin surge at the early, uh, during the night so that as the endorphins peter out during the day, they're going to gradually dip. Whereas if you start at a low, you're, you're going to be low the whole time. So this is the working theory behind it. So to me, I said, I'm so busy, I do not need to be a hero or a pioneer for naltrexone. I mean, people will be lining up to, to, to put uh, patients in this. It's fantastic, low toxicity, it won't do any harm. It's inexpensive, highly effective, easy to take. You don't need specialized physician training. All you need is your medical license and a prescription pad and a paper. And there are few, if any, ethical issues, and I would anticipate widespread use and acceptance very quickly, but I was surprised. Uh, there was huge resistance <laughs> among doctors, so because it's unlicensed, uh, it's regarded as an experimental treatment, it's not evidence-based, doctors aren't covered by their medical malpractice, and it's simply too risky. So what level of evidence is there to support the use of naltrexone? Well, evidence-based medicine is meant to inform us what level of evidence do we have for the practices we engage in. It's not designed to stifle trying new things. It's just designed to admit we don't have all the evidence we'd like to have, but 
here's the evidence we have for the, the treatment we have under consideration. And I think the greatest mistake for evidence-based medicine is that unless it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, that it can't possibly work. And I think that's something that the medical profession in general is going to suffer seriously from unless we address it and say, you don't need that. You, you need good clinical judgment, you need to make a good clinical assessment, and then you, you declare the level of ed evidence you have, and then you, you attempt a treatment and judge the outcome, even by clinical experience. So uh, I decided, well, let's try it out. A 44-year-old male friend of mine with psoriatic arthropathy, I put him on the naltrexone. Uh, I bought it, I paid for it, I gave it to him, said, try this, see how you get on with it. He tried it, took it for six weeks, didn't work, and he quit it, but it didn't do any harm either. So then I thought, well, he's had that for 20 years and maybe he wasn't the best person to try it on, but attempt number one, failure. Attempt number two, another friend of mine, uh, chronic inactive rheumatoid arthritis with joint damage and pain, but there was no active, her energy levels were good and it wasn't actively getting worse. Uh, she just had the chronic destructive part and it seemed to be in remission. So I put her on it and again, no improvement and no harm. My first success came with the third person I tried on it, uh, a, a friend of mine, 33-year-old, who'd acute early onset rheumatoid arthritis, um, and he had dramatic improvement. Low energy, severe heartburn, but no swelling, uh, uh, just pain in his joints and profound fatigue. He was seen by the rheumatologist and all the blood tests were inconclusive. He was prescribed non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and he continued to deteriorate to the extent that he was unable to play with his two-year-old son when he'd come home after work. He had to go to bed very early to rest and he was especially stiff and tired in the mornings. I convinced him to try naltrexone, rapid dramatic improvement, no fatigue, no joint pain, no heartburn. And he ran out of it one day. He was four days short of it and he called around to my house and he just said how rotten he was and uh, he, I got so excited because I saw how bad and debilitated he was without naltrexone. He was four days without it and he was crashing. He said uh, he had to go back on all of his non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. He had to go to bed again. He was stiff, sore and tired in the morning and he couldn't wait till his supply would come in again um, of, of the naltrexone. So he's presently on it and he's very stable. So I approached my local rheumatologist in my fancy hospital and sadly, uh, he wasn't interested and the usual arguments were trotted out to me that you cannot judge efficacy of a new treatment with one case. And the common adage that one sparrow doesn't make a summer, okay, probably placebo, risky experiment. If it doesn't work and joint damage occurs, then you're potentially liable for that. I had a patient uh, in my infertility practice, 36-year-old female who had a previous diagnosis of polycystic ovaries and 10 years of infertility who had a baby already in her program. So I had her on her treatment and she got her first episode of acute onset of rheumatoid arthritis, went to the rheumatologist, was diagnosed uh, with rheumatoid, resistant to non-steroidals and was told, you need methotrexate. And of course, with methotrexate, you can't conceive. So she came to me and said, I thought you might have something better. I said, well, it's funny you happen to come to me because I do. Rapid 80% improvement in her symptoms, absolutely zero side effects for her. She conceived two cycles later. Uh, uh, while on our fertility treatment at the same time and had a successful pregnancy. Later then, there's a 66-year-old male resistant to methotrexate. Uh, he was married, high blood pressure, high lipids, overweight, but otherwise in general good health. December 2004, acute onset of his first episode of rheumatoid arthritis, low energy for three to four months preceding that, felt like he was walking on stones, had swollen painful joints, elbows, fingers, knees, ankles. He was unable to shave, he couldn't comb his hair, couldn't get dressed on his own. Uh, he was walking with crutches with extreme difficulty. He was really in a bad way with this. Between March and August of 2005, he was treated with methotrexate, 10 milligrams weekly, and Mobic, meloxicam, 15 milligrams a day. He continued to deteriorate. July of 2005, he was told that he would need uh, Enbrel with naltrexone. I think, I think there's nearly an obligation, even with the limited data that's available, to consider trying it. So anyway, we decided to put him on it before going for Enbrel. Immediate dramatic improvement. Within two weeks, he was walking without his crutches. I saw him for a review on the 10th of February with absolutely no side effects, and his rheumatologist was simply not interested. Uh.